Okay, I'd like to introduce Casey Shelter. He's going to talk to you about how to write a Linux security module that makes sense for you. Uh, he's going to run through things like uh, what you can accomplish with a Linux security module and what you can't. What's the difference between a major module and a minor one? Uh, for the rest, it's quite a long discussion, so I'll leave it up to Casey. Thank you. Uh, this is the part of the presentation where I forget what I was going to say. Okay, so I have to get on past that. Uh, this, this is me, I'm Casey Schaufler. Uh, I started out working way back. I worked on a 32-bit Linux, sorry, Unix port uh, back in 1979. I'm the author of the SMAC Linux security module, so I actually do have some credentials here. Um, and most recently, I've been working on the security model, module infrastructure uh, to, in support of security module stacking. Uh, as you might guess from this little introduction here, I care very much about security modules. I like security modules a whole lot, and I would like to encourage more people to do so. Hence my presentation here, trying to give you the brief tutorial on how to go about doing it yourself. Uh, let's see, There are a couple of slides here that actually have code on them. If that scares you, now's the time to go. Uh, so why would you write a security module? Uh, we've got a, we've really already got a great set of great collection of collection of security modules, uh, and you can do anything you you would ever want to do with SE Linux anyway. Um, that's what Dan Walsh will tell you. Ru Russell Coker over here will tell you the same thing. So you know why would you want to want to go about doing that, especially because that means writing kernel code. And kernel code is hard. It's in C. Well, it's your best option. Quite bluntly, the security modules we already have are showing their age. They were designed at a, in a time when you sat in a computer room on a, on a computer that actually did its display on paper. So that doesn't ver fit very well with the modern security, the modern security concerns we have on things like a telephone. Uh, on a telephone, you're never going to have somebody reading paper tape. So we've got things that, that really are different now from what they were with what, we've got, what we already got. So we want to encourage people to do new things that actually fit with the way we're using the computers today. And there are things you can't do with SE Linux. Um, I know that the hardcore SE Linux people will tell you that that's just not true. There are things really that you can't do or that you wouldn't want to try to do. And the, way, the reason why you would do it as a Linux security module is this really is the right way to control access to things within the kernel, kernel objects, kernel subjects, uh, et cetera. So what we, get, what we can offer you, what a Linux security module offers you is a mechanism to add restrictive controls to your system. We don't allow you, unfortunately, to replace the existing checks, but you do get to do additional checks. So um, when you actually are, are using a Linux security module, you actually do the traditional checks anyway. You do the uh, UID-based checks that are already in the system. You do capability checks that are already there. Um, and you can't override a denial. So if the mode bits say you can't read the file, your security module isn't going to be able to come in and say, yeah, but he's a nice guy. We're going to let him do it anyway. Uh, it doesn't work that way. What we have are, again, additional restrictive controls. So anything the system would allow you, you know, would allow you to do, you can come in and say, but in my case, I don't want you to do that anyway. Now, if you're going to think about writing a security module, there are a few things you don't want to do. Okay, the first thing you don't want to do is you don't want to du duplicate an existing, an existing module. Uh, you don't want to rewrite SE Linux. You don't want to rewrite AppArmor. You don't want to rewrite Tomo. You want to do something different. Um, if what you want to do is something that SE Linux already does, what you really want to do is go and join the SE Linux community and um, encourage modification and enhancement to support what you want to do. Because those modules are pretty well established. It's actually yeah, most of the people who, who write security modules are pretty easy to work with. Not all of us, but most of them. Um, so don't, do an ex don't redo an existing thing. Next thing is don't rely on you heavily on user space assistance. Uh, there is one security module that's being sold as a proprietary module. 
you, you, it's done under GPLs, you patch it in. But all it does is it says, hey, you want to make an access control check? I'm going to ask the user mode and see what it says. Um, that's not, not, first off, it's not very efficient. Second off, uh, you're never going to get that, get that upstream because all you're doing there is you're, saying, is you're providing a mechanism for a proprietary code to do GPL things, things that should be done in the kernel. So don't do that. It's been done. It's unpopular. Um, and finally, now I say don't inflame Alvero because if you inflame Alvero, you will get flamed by Alvero. This is not something you generally want to have happen to you. Um, and I say Alvero because he's kind of the, 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 the ultimate guy to be flamed by. But in this picture, which is from the, the Linux kernel summit, any one of these people or any set of these people uh, can come on can come down on you like a ton of bricks if you do things that are really, really stupid. So think about what you're going to do. Do something that's rational. Use the, you know, use the kernel coding style, kernel, you know, general kernel mechanisms. Pay attention to your RCUs, and yeah, everything will be just fine. But remember, you're playing in the kernel, uh, and you're playing seriously when you're down there. Our most important principle, um, you can read this at your leisure, but always do your research, which is to say, go out and find, you know, go look at existing security modules, see what they do, see the way they go about doing things, and where it's appropriate, use the, you know, duplic use the code, duplicate the code. Um, don't invent things you don't have to, because you really, there's no need to. Um, when I wrote the SMAC security module, I took a whole lot of code out of SE Linux. Why? Because I didn't have to write it, it was already there. So uh, you're encouraged to do the same thing. Uh, when you see something that's similar to what you want to do, just you know, pull it in. Everybody will be happy. Uh, nobody's going to be, be upset. Um, that's the way we do things in the Linux community. So a few things you need to know about if you're going to write a Linux security module. Uh, again, you're, you're working in the kernel. You're working in the kernel environment. So the first thing you need to know about are hooks. So what we have throughout the Linux kernel are a sprinkling of, of functions, and they all begin with the word security. Um, and these are the, the functions that get called into your module that will tell the system to do something different. Um, some of them, some of these hooks you use for doing uh, data management. For example, if you have to keep track of the number of times that a process has opened a file in, uh, on a particular, on a device file system, just to pull something out of the air. Um, if you decide that you want your security module to say, if you've opened DevNull 400 times, I'm done with you. Um, you would want it to be able to maintain that. So you need to maintain some data about that. So some of the hooks allow you to do data management. Um, there are also hooks for doing access checks. These are in all the popular places where you get uh, access control checks. For example, you send a signal to another process. There's a hook that says, oh, uh, does the security module want to do something special with that? If you try to open a file, there's another, another hook there that will do whatever you like. You want to create a, create a sim link. Boom, there's a hook there. So this, what you do is you write your little functions that do the little things that are special for your security module, and you just create, create up your list of those, uh, plug them into the infrastructure, and there you go. Um, and you can pick and choose as you need to. So you can write a security module that only cares about sending signals, or delivering packets, or opening files. You don't have to write an entire security suite in order to do a security module. You only have to deal with the things that you really care about. Now hooks, we have fun, fun return values from hooks. See, I told you we'd be getting, getting technical here. Okay. Um, hooks have, mo many of them, <clears throat> many of them return values, some of them don't. Um, but if you do return a value, the values you're gonna return are either you know, enomem, which meant you tried to allocate some memory and you couldn't. That's the most annoying one, by the way. If you're, if you're actually gonna write a security module, the most annoying one is enomem. Because when you can't allocate memory and you, it, it 
tends to propagate down everywhere and you have to put a lot of code in to, to deal with that case and it turns out it almost never happens. Uh, E-access means that um, your policy denied access for its policy and E-perm says, if you had privilege, I'd let you do this, but you don't, so go away. So we got several kinds of hooks. We have object-based hooks. Um, an object is a thing in, a, in security model parlance, which is the, the passive entity. So you have a subject, which is your active entity. You have an object, which is your passive entity. And subjects do things to, sub, subjects access objects. Really very simple here. So when you have an object, it's the thing, of the passive entity, the file, the other process, the, the thing you're, you're trying to deal with. Um, we have hooks that are attached to dealing directly with um, system objects, uh, things like at inodes, uh, file descriptors, things that the system treats as entities. These aren't always the same thing that people look at. So for example, if you, when, you, when you're looking at a file, you're really looking at an inode. The inode could actually have seven different names if you have six hard links to it. So the name is not going to be the actual object. But that's okay, we'll talk about that more, late, more in just a bit here. The important thing is that we have attributes associated with these objects. And you can do your access controls based on any of the attributes that are associated with that. It may be a little bit difficult for a human to understand that you're dealing with inode 706. But that's okay. Um, that's an artifact of the Linux file system, Linux namespace. Uh, it's just something we have to deal with. So we also have path-based hooks for those, that, those people who say, well, I've got Etsy password. I don't care whether it's a file, whether it's a symlink, whether it's a device. I don't care what Etsy password is. Anything called Etsy password, or whether it's in a container, whether it's in a weird mount place, I don't care. You know, I'm going to associate my security policy with the path name. Um, now, this may not fully identify something as an object, yeah, because it's, yeah, you're going by the name, and in some cases, you'll have the name, there, be, there may, not actually, may not actually be anything associated with that name. Um, and we've got sim links to worry about, and mount points to worry about, but it's very human friendly. So, uh, we actually do have hooks, you can say, if, you, if I found it, see password, I'm great, then I can do something, make, make some kind of check on that. <clears throat> we have security blobs. What's a security blob? Well, each of these uh, kernel objects that I was talking about earlier, you know, an inode, a file, to, uh, um, a file structure, a credential structure, uh, has, the, has a mechanism for hanging off a, a piece of data for, your, for the Linux security modules. We call these blobs. Why do we call them blobs? Well, what else would you call them? It's an arbitrary set of data. data. It's completely up to the, the module to maintain, um, to manage, to um, make decisions based on. So the system doesn't actually care about these security blobs beyond, you know, outside of your module. All they care about is that you allocate them and, and free them appropriately. But it's up to you to do that. So you have the information. If you want it, you don't have to, have to maintain it if you don't. And this is, this is important. It comes up a little bit in just a second here. So if you've been in the kernel at all, how many of you, by the way, have actually been looking in the Linux kernel recently? Okay, good, 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 okay, so, so this won't be foreign to, to many of you. Uh, we have a security blob is, is the data that you're gonna associate with, with things in the kernel for the security module. Uh, the set context, you probably, you may have heard this term, is the text string that's associated with that security information. The sec ID is a number that's associated with that string and that, that information. Uh, the sec ID is strictly internal to the kernel. Uh, every now and then somebody will suggest, well, we can export this and we slap them down rather quickly. Uh, or we try to. Um, Google's pretty aggressive about that, but we, will, we won't go there. Uh, but the important thing is here that, that for every blob, you're going to have at least one 
set context, which is the string that's associated with it so that people can use. So that if you're gonna save this information out onto a, a media somewhere or export it out to, to the user, you'll have a string to do that, so. Now, we have two kinds of security modules at this point. We have major ones and minor ones. What's a major security module? A major security module is actually any module that uses blobs. So if it has to maintain any kind of information about the process or the file or uh, security information of any sort about anything and it's gonna hang it off of one of these objects, it uses a blob, that makes it a major module. Um, you only, and you only get one of them because we don't have a mechanism yet for sharing the security blob pointer. I'll talk about that more later. That's one of my ongoing um, crusades. Um, and the major module gets called last. So after you've done the capabilities check, after you've done the traditional Unix, uh, Unix style DAC checks, um, that's when, you know, after you've called any minor modules, then you call the major security module. Uh, SE Linux is a major module. Smack is a major module. Tomoyo is a major module, actually. Um, the, only mo the only one that isn't is Yama. Yama is a minor security module. Uh, minor security modules differ from major security modules, and they don't maintain any state. So they're completely capable of making all, their acts, all the decisions that they want to make without storing any state about the objects or the processes involved. So if they just use, for example, user IDs, if you said, had a policy that said, you can only write to Etsy password if you have a, an even user ID or you can only write to a file if you are a member of yeah, at least three groups. I don't know why you do that, uh, but you could do that and you wouldn't need to have um, any information associated with any of those files or any of those processes. It would just be a, a policy that you enforce that doesn't have specific information about those, about those objects or, or processes. So these things are called after the capabilities and, and user ID checks, but before any of the major modules. Uh, Yama does some things where it, it has particular information about sim links, mount points, et cetera, that it makes decisions based on. So those are the basics here. Now we're gonna, now we can say, okay, well, I've got my security module. I know what I want to do. Okay, well, let's design it, okay? Um, because if, well, or we could just iteratively implement it, but I, I think we might want to do a little bit of talk about design because uh, it's kind of old fashioned, but we can do that anyway. All right, so first thing is what do you want to protect? Okay, why are, you, yeah, if you're not looking to protect something, you're probably not really thinking about security. Okay, so you might want to protect files or you might, you know, you want, might want to protect all the files on a particular file system, or you want, might want to protect all the files that are created by um, a particular user, or you might want to protect things that are, have a particular path name, Etsy password, for example. Uh, you might want to take proce protect processes from each other. So you might want to say any process that's got a small memory footprint shouldn't be able to send signals to processes with large memory footprints. Um, or I don't want system processes to send signals to user processes, or vice versa. Uh, any kind of uh, protection you might want to, want to do here. Um, you might want to say, I want to protect, protect this kind of data or that kind of data. Um, or you might say, I have system resources and I want to protect system resources. I want to protect uh, the resources used by this sort of application from resources on that, that kind of application. So the question is, what is it you want to protect? And of course, to go along with that is what do you want to protect it from? Uh, traditional Linux uh, file system access is all based on the notion of users. Used to be, back in the dark ages, if you ran a program and it did bad things to the, to the computer, it was your fault. Today, I run a program and it does bad things to the computer. Oh, it's a malicious app. So, we have very different security paradigms there. I am not protecting your data from me. 
I'm now protecting Facebook's at data from Netflix. Um, and it doesn't matter that the same person, you know, that two different people ran the applications, it's the application that's at fault, not the person. So who are you protecting it from? Are you protecting it from the program or, or the person or the network that the application came from or the network that the instructions came from? Whatever it is you want to protect it from, you need to know that. And you need to put that in terms of what it is you want your, your uh, security module to actually do. And then when, of course, when you've detected that you've got this situation, what are you gonna do about it? Okay, well, you could deny access. That's the traditional thing. So I've decided only, only odd-numbered uh, processes can read Etsy Shadow. Okay. Then you just return e-access and you're done. Uh, you might wanna log the attempt. Uh, you might want to keep track of the number of attempts that, fa that, that failed and, and after three of them decide you're going to deny access. Another thing you could do is change some attributes. You say, aha, uh, this, is, this is my favorite one. This has actually been proposed, not by me. Um, if you get access to a file because of a group, then the ownership of the file is changed to you because you're the last person to, to access the file, and so now you're responsible for it. Um, it makes sense to somebody, all right? And again, you know, this is all about modules that make sense for you, not necessarily for me. You know, I've got my ideas, and um, they're ar archaic. So you can change some attributes if you want. Or you can do something clever. Um, what might be clever? Well. Again, um, you're protecting something. You've read it three times. Um, now that's enough. So, or you've executed a program 17 times in the past hour. I've decided that what that means is that the program is coming up and dying, and you keep re-invoking it. Uh, you're obviously not paying attention to what's going on, so I'm just not going to let you open it and let you use that anymore. Okay, I'm going to delete it from the disk because obviously the program just crashes all the time. You could do something cleverer than that. But. Okay, so maintaining information. I talked about security blobs, blobs a little bit earlier. Uh, it's like, here's our list of blobs that you can use. Uh, we have uh, credentials, files, inodes, all kinds of good things that you uh, can associate information with. So your security module can, can put the information on, the, put information that you care about, that you think is important, onto these things, and then use your module to, to make the decision based on that. I'll let him get his picture and then I'll move on. Okay, so, I, by the way, I never claimed that um, I was going to be, have a really good smooth flow on this presentation. So, we're gonna change, change gears just a little bit here. Now talk about processes. So, okay, so fine. I've, I've got processes, I've got objects. I need some, some way to, to say, what can I tell about my, if I've put some information on my process that I'm gonna use for access control checks, how do I get at that? Well, I'm gonna look at my process attributes. Um, uh, we're very, we're very um, fortunate to have slash proc. We actually have a directory in slash proc called adder where you can put the attributes for your process. Um, if you're gonna write a security module, you're gonna look and you say, hey look, there's a bunch of things already that are get used by SE Linux and Smack and AppArmor. I'm just gonna reuse those. Please re resist that temptation. Um, what we found is that um, there, there's one attribute in there called current, which is the current security context of the process, and that's, that's great. AppArmor uses it, Smack uses it, and SE Linux use it. If at some point in the not too distant future we have multiple modules, uh, if you have SMAC and SE Linux on the system at the same time, what should it tell you? Well, the answer is SE Linux is SE Linux had it first, and the rest of us just uh, use, that it, use that inappropriately. So we're already finding places where we're starting to stumble over each other. So when you create your security module, when you create your attributes, give them their own names. Yeah, object attributes. Object attributes are fun, too. Um, we're talking about the information about the things that you have on your file, for example, on your file system. So 
Uh, good news is we have traditional attributes, and you can use those to your heart's content. If you want to make decisions based on odd-numbered user IDs or odd-numbered group IDs, go right ahead, go wild. Uh, if you want to say, I don't care you know, what the mode bits say, you always have to be in this group if you want to write files. Or if you want to send a signal to another process, um, your, UID, your UID has to be odd. Yeah, um, it's up to you. Again, it's what makes sense for you. Um, but you can use all of the traditional attributes in any way you like, and that's fine. The only thing is don't change what they mean. A user ID should identif identify the human being who's using the program. It should not identify the application, like a certain system has done. OK, so you, you don't want to use the user ID as the app ID. You want a separate app ID. So how do you do that? Well, what you do there is we have extended attributes. Now, uh, what we can do is on a file system object, you can place any arbitrary attribute you want. You give it a name. We actually have a name, a name value pair. Uh, you put it on the, on the file system. Uh, it's maintained by the kernel. Uh, it requires privilege to modify. The kernel can, can maintain these to their heart's content. And uh, they're arbitrarily sized. You can put any information you want. They're efficient. Um, and they work really well. So you don't have to actually do things where you're overloading existing attributes inappropriately. Again, like some systems do. You can also do things by path names. Okay, again, you know, you can do, okay, you can do your control by path names. We have hooks for those. Um, you don't get actually, you don't actually get to use just the path name string. That would be too convenient. Uh, you do have to use with the deal with the internal path structure, but that's not really that bad. It's not horrible. It's not convenient. Um, and remember that the path names are not definitive because we've got sim links and mount points and containers and oh my. Um, but this will get you yeah, to where you want to be if you want to use those. So what did I think? OK, so that's the basics there. Now, networking. These, by the way, are, this is, by the way, the, the original demo of IPv2. Um, and th the first word here is, you may not want to actually think about doing too much with this. And the reason is, is pretty simple, and that is that we've got NetFilter, and NetFilter does all kinds of wonderful things. And if you really think you want to do access control based on network attributes, we have, you know, NetFilter that works really well. If you want to do something really different, then it's perfect. We do, do have mechanisms for that. Uh, but NetFilter will do most of the most of the kinds of change, kind of controls that you would probably want to do. On socket operations, um, we actually have checks. We have checks for bind, and we have, you know, we have hooks for bind and listen and connect. Uh, we have hooks for packet delivery, which is very, very useful. Um, and we have a mechanism called SOPIRSEC, which you can use to pass the security attributes of process on one end, process on another, under certain circumstances. Uh, things are a little bit different between uh, Unix domain sockets and IP domain sockets. Unix domain sockets are easy. Why is that? Because on the system, we have access actually to both sides of the connection. So when you're doing a, when you're sending a, a, UD, a UDP packet, I'm uh, sorry, a, U, a UDS packet, uh, acronyms just, ugh. All right, so when, when we're dealing with Unix domain sockets, I can actually look at the, the socket on the other end and make my decisions based on this, my, the socket I have and the socket that's over there. So that actually makes things, things reasonably easy. Um, again, I can do it on a connect or I can do it on a send. So because I have both, both ends, I can make the decision based on, on the conglomeration of information. And that makes things really easy. Uh, IP domain sockets are a little bit harder because we only have one end at a time. So when I'm sending a packet, I know who I am and I know who I think I'm, I know the address that I'm sending it to, but I don't know really anything more about it. And when I'm receiving a packet, I know who I am um, and I know some attributes about the, 
about the far end that got sent to me on the packet, but I don't really know who he is. I can't find out and you know, I can't ask. You know, I can't say, well, oh, I got a cool packet. I wonder if I got this from Joe. Well, good luck. Um, now the good news is that we do have the packet header available and so we can, uh, we can use IP options and in fact there's a mechanism called CIPSO, the Common Internet Protocol Security Option which is supported uh, in the Linux kernel. Uh, we're also getting support for Calypso any minute now. Calypso is the IP6 ver IPv6 version of the, the same thing. Um, and when you receive the packet, you can then use any of that information to make the decision you want. So if you decide you don't want to get uh, packets from a particular network, you can make that decision, even though you could, could have made that decision with NetFilter. Uh, or if you decide, I am going to assume that anything that comes from this host is Russell's. It came from Russell. And I will make the access control decision based on the notion that this packet came from Russell. Okay, audit trail. Audit trail is very important because you're going to need to, because when you, when you decide you're going to deny, deny access to something, you want to put that in the audit trail uh, and you want to put the information that, that's relevant about the access control decision into the audit trail. Uh, so what you have to do is define your audit data. Uh, there's a header file where you have to, you create a structure, you put it in there, it gets shared um, with any of the other, with all of the other things you can put into the audit trail, which is one reason why the audit trail is a little bit difficult to use these, you know, because there's so many just different kinds of information in there. Uh, we have, <clears throat> um, the data you put in there is, is completely arbitrary and it's up to you. And you get to define the, the, the format of your record. Um, we have some, some pleasant functions that you can use to format the data. I'm not gonna go into excessive detail except to say that it's there, it's easy to use. Um, and it creates large amounts of <clears throat> large volumes of data as audit trails are wont to do. Uh, so just kind of keep this under control when you're, when you're thinking about that. So um, at some point, if you write a security module, you're going to want to make you're going to want to be able to control its behavior. Um, why I thought a chuck wagon, wagon race was the best picture to use to identify this, I don't know, but it seemed like a good idea at the time, and so I kept it. Uh, so, so why have a security module interface to me? Well, you might want to change your, your access rules. You might want to decide that although on Tuesdays, odd-numbered user IDs can access these files, and on Wednesdays, even-numbered process IDs can access these files, uh, or something else. Um, you might want to gather statistics and be able to spit them out. So, for example, you could say 5,000, you know, keep track of the number of processes that have opened dev null. I don't know why you would think that is security relevant, but somebody might. Um, anything that you want to export or import to the system about the security policy or about the security behavior, you'd use um, a security model interfa interface to do. Um, you want to load your initial policy. Um, so what we do is we use a sysf sysfs uh, entry uh, rather than doing a syscall or an ioctl because syscalls are expensive and ioctls are expensive and painful. Um, and mechanically, it's very simple. Um, you create the mount point, uh, you register the file system, and you do then just mount the file system. Um, and so you go in, <coughs> when you're writing your files, you go into uh, any of the existing modules, take their file system, take it aside, change it to work the way you want it to. And you can use this to do any kind of arbitrary information uh, exchange you want to. The only suggestion is that um, you use ASCII text rather than any kind of binary interface because binary interfaces are broken from the, from the get-go. I'm speeding up. Okay, uh, security module stacking. Okay, so let's say we've got, yeah, you've written a module and you've written a module and you've written a module. Now we're, how are we gonna make them all work together here? So today, uh, if you've got a minor module, it's easy. You put your, uh, your, your, your hook registration function in right after the Yama hook registration function, and you're done. Um, 
If you want to stack major modules, you've got a bit of a problem because they tend to be pointy on the top, and if you put another one on, they fall off. Uh, no, the problem is that, there sh is that we only have one blob pointer. And if you've got a blob and you've got a blob, then you've got a conflict. And you don't want, you don't want, to, use, you don't want to use his blob in order to get his, to get, and get his data because that would be just not, not work very well. So today we're saying uh, you only get one at a time. However, there's a way to cheat. So if you're writing a security module and you know you want to stack it with SE Linux, you just put your blob data into the SE Linux blob, uh, compile it up, and know where the offset is, and you're fine. Uh, like I say, it's cheating. We're working on this. Um, now in the future, uh, and of course this is still under development, uh, we got several, we're going to be allowing multiple major modules. It's just a matter of, of working out the details on how best to share that one pointer or maybe get rid of that pointer and yeah, have the information directly in the structures. Uh, there's significant debate as to which is the best way to do it, but uh, have faith, we're working on it. Um, the other issue is the representation of the security context. If you look at the, a SMAC security context and SE Linux security context, you can't tell the one from the other. Um, so it's kind of, we need a mechanism so you can say, here's the security context which contains both. Um, a small matter of programming, as they say. So, I'm about to wrap up here, so get your questions ready. Uh, so first things, have a good reason, okay? Yes, your PhD is important to you. Um, on the other hand, we've got you know, direct brain computer interfaces coming up, okay? You probably want to have a really good security policy for that. Um, and it should be something you can do in the, could and should do in the kernel. If you're talking about doing cryptographic authentication of communications, you really probably want to leave that up in user space. Um, and then follow up with, with appropriate support uh, in the user space and documentation. Uh, documentation is very important. Um, and anybody who can re represent, recognize the animal involved on the, yeah, on the O'Reilly book here gets, gets extra credit. Okay, don't reinvent the wheel. Um, we've got modules that do things already. The generic security has been done. It's been done to death. And we're in the 21st century. The 1980s uh, view of system security that we've got implemented today, it's probably not what you want to do. Please do something, do something new. No one liked Bell and Lepodula when we did it the first time. Nobody liked it when we did it the second time. Nobody liked it when we did it the third time. Do something else. Um, show us something new, okay? No one has yet done a good application resource management security policy. We have all kinds of, of, of fluky things up, up in user space that interact with binder drivers and, and you know, throw things around their left shoulder um, and reuse system security attributes in ways they were never intended. Don't do that. Come up with something that makes sense. Uh, come up with a paradigm for it. You know, use it. Yeah, make it consistent. Um, Sensor-based access controls would be fun. Uh, imagine, if you will, your you take your laptop into a place where the the network uh, is is completely uh, tainted, like Las Vegas. Um, and immediately upon detecting taint, it sets the the machine on fire because you don't want to take that back home. I, again, I wouldn't want that, but this is about a security module that makes sense to you, not for me. Okay. We've got the one that makes sense for me. Um, and finally, it doesn't have to be dull. Do something fun. It's like, let's have a security policy that makes sense. Um, if you've got a camera on your machine, you know, look and see who's using it. Uh, it doesn't have, again, it doesn't have to be dull. And with that, thank you very much. I'm going to let, let our genuine Any questions? Um, so you mentioned that um, minor security modules can have state, so they're completely states, uh, has to be stateless. 
And then you uh, give an example like counting how many times the file has been open block, uh, has been open more than 10 times block. Wouldn't that require a state? Okay, so the question about requiring state. If you manage the state yourself without using the security blobs, you can do it. So there's still a way to maintain a like, state right. inside yeah, minor the, one. Yeah, so, so for example, on, on that example, I've opened dev null 10 times, um, you're out of here. Okay. Um, if you don't associate the state with dev null, or you don't, and, and you just associate it with the, the process, you can do that so long as you don't actually use the security block. You can have a separate table somewhere that says, oh, here's dev null, it's been opened 10 times by yeah, this process. Again, so long as you don't put it in the security blob, if you maintain the state elsewhere, you're perfectly okay. And in fact, um, Tomoyo actually has, an has a secondary implementation where it doesn't use the security blobs, it just keeps its own tables. Um, that makes management a little bit more difficult and it has performance imp impact, but you can do it. Uh, I'm just wondering what the most common practical examples uh, are that you've seen of uh, people needing uh, security module type things that SE Linux actually can't do, because that has been a very <laughs> common thing for me. Um, SE Linux, oh, uh, uh, what SE Linux can't do is not do the things that you don't care about. For example, if you wanted to, imp to implement strict Bell and Lepodula, uh, which with levels and categories, but not do type enforcement, you cannot do that with SE Linux because SE Linux brings in the entire busload of, of facilities and features, whether you want them or not. Thanks. Any more questions? No more questions? Okay, great. I'd like everyone to give a hand to Casey for his time in presenting. <laughs>